Canada, right? That's right, Montreal. Yeah, Montreal. And then winter. Also on the path of totality. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And then um, he's an expert in like Feldenkrais. Feldenkrais. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then has he written a lot of books. You know, the stuff of piano playing, these bookshops, and all that. Okay. So you have his bio and everything in that uh, course module, right? Big ten. So you can read all about it. Let's welcome uh, Professor Lee. Great to be with you. Thank you for for sharing this time together. So. Uh, piano pedagogy students, so you're learning everything, of not only how to play the piano, but how to teach the piano. Uh, and of course, there are multiple methods, there are multiple approaches to piano technique. Uh, and today's lecture is going to be on the piano somatics approach. So this is a, a, an approach to piano technique where you try to use a conscious use of the body. Uh, so. You know, there's one school of piano playing that says, oh, don't think about the physical, it's just a distraction. Use your ear and move, and the, the musical sound that you want will come out. And if you've had good training, this is very much the case. Uh, but sometimes you see people trying to do that, and you look at the way their hands are moving, and there's some, I don't know, some stuff that just the, the actual, the trajectories of the movement don't seem to be. I've seen people play where you know, their, their actual movement was so beautiful, but the sound coming out of the piano is dong, 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 dong. And so I said, wow, if they could make the music sound as beautiful as their, their body is doing, that would be great, but there's a disconnect. So what sometimes you, you, you hear, there's this disconnect going on. Why, why is that? And how could we approach teaching piano to young ones in a way to address this disconnect and reconnect ourselves to the piano. So uh, I wrote uh, four, I did a Feldenkrais training. Feldenkrais is neuromuscular re-education, kind of like a Alexander Technique version two. Uh, <laughs> Feldenkrais knew Alexander in the 1940s in London and saw what Alexander was doing and as a scientist, as a neurophysiologist, he saw, oh, this is great, but we can do it this way. We, we can teach the nervous system to retain the benefits of an Alexander lesson by extrapolating the types of movements involved. And it's all about the skeleton. So uh, lots of physiotherapies, they address the muscles. Of course, muscles move bones. Every muscle is designed to either open a joint or close a joint, yeah? And they work in tandem. So if the bones are out of alignment, uh, for instance, somebody has a bad back and they're going to strengthen the core to improve the back pain. But if the back is overextended and now these muscles are working harder because they're stronger, you're going to get more pain, not less. The muscles don't need to be stronger, they need to be more intelligent. They need to bring the bones of the skeleton into alignment. So that's talking about the whole body. So at a certain point in all this, I grew up in Montreal. I did my Feldenkrais training, 1988 to 1992. After having studied piano with a, 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 a professor in Montreal named Phil Cohen, who to my mind was the Moshe Feldenkrais of the piano world. He was exploring this kind of this choreography, not moving wildly, but moving in a way which completely maps on everything you're doing to the shape of the phrase, to the orchestration. So this is Phil, this is my first mentor. Yeah, and, uh, and so then I, uh, uh, I studied with him, then I went to do my Feldenkrais training. This is Moshe Feldenkrais, who, who uh, developed the Feldenkrais method. He was a world champion judoka, and then noticed that when his body is in good alignment, as it must be in judo, and the leverages are working well, uh, then all his organic functions were better. His digestion was better, his, his temperament was better, and then he extrapolated that to, to a method which helps all sorts of people, from people with uh, stroke victims and multiple sclerosis and, and cerebral palsy to actors, da dancers, and musicians. Okay, so, and then I moved to Yugoslavia to study with Kemal Gekic. 
And uh, this is a world-class pianist who exemplifies all those movement qualities that I've been searching for. It was kind of serendipity. I met him in Montreal two weeks before I started my Feldenkrais training. He played at the Montreal International Piano Competition. You can actually find that concert online, Camel Gate Beach, Montreal, on YouTube. And uh, it was quite, quite the introduction. It was quite the, the start of a friendship and collaboration, which continues to this day. So we're, OK, I get sidetracked. I wanted to have a little bit of a background. So 1990, I moved to Yugoslavia. I've lived there for 30 years now. I was piano assistant for 10 years until he moved to Florida. He now teaches at FIU, Florida International University. And at a certain point, the Feldenkrais, Cohen, the hand, watching Kemal play, oh my goodness, that hand is like a mini bun. The hand walks on key, it runs on key when you play fast, it jumps on key, but the finger has an ankle and a knee and a hip joint and a pelvis and a torso, and the torso even breathes when you move your arm in a breathing motion, yeah? not just a falling motion, but an actual in and out breath, sometimes lateralized, we'll get to that. So, the hand is designed to grasp. When the hand grasps, the fingers don't can, the fingers can curl, that's one kind of grasping, but if you try now to bring the fingertip to the thumb tip like that and squeeze and feel where the tension is and where the sense of power is, right? And then do the same thing, but bring the pad of the thumb to the pad of the fingers and squeeze and feel the difference in the sense of tension and the difference in the sense of power. So is it, is it obvious to everybody that here, like, I feel kind of tense in my forearm, and here I'm looser in the forearm, and I'm actually, and there's muscular activation. You feel it right up in the triceps. The triceps, it's both, you feel it. You feel the upper arm contracting, and here, it's more local. It's the lower arm contracting. So, you, if you want power, you, you use the larger muscles, the muscles closer to the core. So already, this grasping action, and this is what makes us different from monkeys, right? Monkeys can pick up things like this only by adduction and abduction of the thumb. But we pick up things by opposing the thumb to the fingers. That's, they say that that's largely what led us to be intelligent, to be able to use tools, to be able to do all sorts of things that we can play the piano. So, but the, <laughs> interestingly enough, this complicated, for instance, how am I going to play with the thumb if I'm opposing my thumb to the fingers because the fingers are going down and the thumb is going up? That's already completely illogical. What am I talking about? You can't. Well, if you unoppose the thumb, unoppose it, unoppose it, you'll see it goes down and then out in a big arc and it comes up to the side. And now if I use the beginning of that arc, there's my thumb opposition playing the piano. So out here, and then you, it opposes. So if you just put, put, put your hand on your desk or on your knee or whatever, and you try to draw the thumb towards the fifth finger, for instance, up, that an arch instantly arises. Okay? And that arch of the hand is tremendously structurally potent. I'm saying this is the setup for everything we're going to do today, as every little kid who plays piano developed uh, one exercise in piano when we were seated the swamp monster there, where you just say that, oh, you can see the eyes of a monster. Oh my god, he's waking up. I think this was done with many kids. Oh, make him go back to sleep. Don't, oh, he's going to come and eat. Oh, he's going to go back to sleep. Thank god. Oh my god. So I taught this to like young children. One boy, for instance, the first time I did it, this boy came in and he said, <laughs> child to do that is completely understandable because their fingers are very small and the key is very big. So of course I'm going to use my arm to help push the key down. The grown-ups, the fingers, the same size as the key. And it's actually very powerful if you have this grasping, so there's no need. And the, the downside is there's no melody. It's low, 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 and you want to go, right? 
So I, I, I was too tired. I taught all day, and I didn't have time to explain all this to them, so I just did the swamp monster with them. And with no words said, he went and played the like that. Standing had been introduced into his nervous system. The neurophysiology of piano playing. There's, there's a, a, a sensorial image of standing in the hand, then all of a sudden, the arm knows what to do. The arm doesn't need to help the finger push the key down. The, does my body, it, when I walk, I'm going to sense the weight of my torso. You know, I'm going to feel the weight of my torso pushing my foot into the ground. And the, the, the weight of my torso is pushing the foot into the ground. Who walks like that? It's like from a a functional skeletal point of view, it's insane. Right? The whole point of walking is that there are individual leg motions, left, right, left, right. So if you could see me from the waist up, would, would you know that there are individual leg motions powering my walk? No, it looks like I'm on a segway. Yeah. I'm really on a segway. <laughs> That's how sophisticated the relationship of the legs to the pelvis to the torso is. Because the pelvis actually goes through a complicated figure eight motion in three dimensions. I mean, it's, it's amazingly complicated. And I'll prove it to you because now my left hip is higher, more to the outside, and more forward. And now my right hip is higher and more to the outside and more forward. And so you see, that if I would make a slam or something, else, you would actually see it. But all that, it's, it's miniaturized. It's like, it's, it's economized. But all that is going on. And that's what, so when the baby walks, the first time the baby stand like that. Because they haven't developed this complicated thing. And actually, so, so a baby walks at one like this. When do you think the child, again, we'll, we'll get to piano walking, but how about real walking? When do you think the child develops this fully, this complicated figure eight motion that I'm showing you now? Get, take a wild guess. They start at one, so when? Two, three, when? Nobody knows. Nobody's even willing to guess. Come on. Pick a number. <laughs> Four, five, good. Seven. <laughs> At, it takes them six whole years, and nobody's teaching them. Oh, you should, you know, you, no, just they're going through life, they're running, they're playing, and everything, and gradually through sensorial learning, they're developing this capacity. It takes six years. What's the equivalent for that at the piano? The equivalent is the rotation of the wrist, the lateral movement of the wrist, the movement back and forth. So all, a lot of the rotation movements of the hand facilitate this evenness. For instance, the fingers are uneven. So if I try to play without rotating, then it's very difficult. And I feel my hand instantly tenses and when there's a little bit of a rotation. You see that little, but it's very discreet. And much of the time, just as the child never learns about rotating their pelvis to walk smoothly, it just develops. If we were on a good piano track in terms of our technique, that will develop naturally. And there's a tendency, when you talk about it, to overdo it yourself. But it's a necessary part. I've really jumped ahead of myself. <laughs> I'm trying to, because there, but you see the, the relationship of the way the hand moves to the way the human body moves and the way we learn movement and the developmental steps, it's very complex. Uh, so I wrote, like I said, four big books. And you're welcome to look at these afterwards if you like. The track of piano playing in the first one mostly talks about that hand arch and the ramifications. The second one, we I realized people came to me and, oh, look at my arch, it's really good. And then there, it's like the hand is stiff as a board. <laughs> I realize that arch needs to be functional. In other words, and every judoka will know this, 
when the body stands up, it comes to a state of unstable equilibrium. Yeah? So this is, this is stable and it's balanced. If it could stand like this, very hard to do, <laughs> it would be unstable, but still balanced. And that's the design of the human body. I really have to start talking about piano, but this is important. Uh, uh, it is said that a, a child of five years old can push over the strongest man in the world with his, her little finger if the man's ankles are tied together. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is lose your balance. That's proof that we, but the, no other mammals are upright like us. All, the spine, which is very complex, many, many vertebrae, is horizontal. It's designed to have movement ripple through the body like a cat, but no spine except ours has achieved that verticality. It's really sophisticated, and it takes a lot of brain power. Uh, what's the name of that guy who wrote Sapiens, his history of the world, the human? And he noticed that you know the, 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 the first uh, humans who became erect, it happened at a certain point in time, at, and exactly at that time, their brain became three times as large, proportionally, compared to other animals at that, at that point in time. But he didn't make the connection. We, need, we don't need all that computing power to be intelligent and write poetry and go to the moon. We need all that computing power to maintain the state of unstable equilibrium. Just like the Segway, it has a huge computer inside to keep it balanced. So, now, the, that's the second book, Unstable Equilibrium. The third book is all thumbs. It's a book about the thumb. I don't have one with me here, but it's a book all about the thumb because this thumb is so weird compared to the other fingers. If the thumb tries to be a finger, the whole hand is cramped because it's trying to be like the other fingers. But the thumb, when the thumb tries to be different, it becomes a swan instead of an ugly duck. So the third book is about that. And the fourth book takes the hand back to a freestanding apprenticeship. Babies walk only after a year. They lie down, they lift their head, they extend, they rotate, they flex, they do bungee. They do a hundred things, more than a hundred. They learn many, many skills before they get up after. Nobody learns to walk by walking, okay? Imagine if you took a baby and stood them up at day one. Walk, walk. <laughs> that baby's not going to feel too well. Or she's not going to do it, do it very well. So the pre-standing apprenticeships for the hand said, well, wait a minute. Every pianist was told the first day, stand up and walk. And so no wonder our hands are tense. No wonder we feel like we don't know how to do it. Why not give the hand a pre-standing apprenticeship? And this works for, for pianists who've been playing for years. You go back and you remedialize the process and sense your hand skeletally and you sense better the function of the hand, the basic functions of the hand, the grasping action, how it manifests and how it can help you to play with, not with only no pain, and no injury, but with richer sound and more agility. Okay. So those four books have over 250 awareness through piano movement lessons, sort of exercises to bring the hand to this state. Many people have told me, wonderful book, Alan. Nobody's got time to expect me to read all that. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> and I'm a studio teacher. I've got how many students? So. That's what motivated me to, to, to write pianos. So I distilled all the lessons of these books down in 28 double sized lessons for the beginning pianist's hand. And it's divided into eight sections. And this method, uh, by the way, uh, I didn't bring all the books. Uh, the, it's the, this is the teacher's manual. And then you've got the pupils' the manual, pupils with volume one and two which don't have all the instructions. Like you see, there's all sorts of instructions here, but the pupil's book only has the picture on the left side of the page and the composition in much bigger type on the right side of the page. 
so the, the teacher's language. And the conceit of pianos is that you know, we're going to do all sorts of things, like Feldenkrais lessons. Feldenkrais is largely done lying down and you do weird things with your arms, or you, you know, like this, or you move the legs of the other side. All sorts of movements you would never do in real life. And then you stand up and you walk better, you stand better, you feel better, you move better. So the idea in the, here is as well, we'll do, the hand's going to do weird things which you would never do at the piano. And then I wrote compositions where you do do that weird thing at the piano, but eventually you're doing this weird stuff, but the hand feels better and then it moves better. We've always already seen one demonstration in this small box or something, right? So there's 28 lessons, and this is designed to be complementary to other piano methods. So it's not you're not going to replace another method with this one, but you're going to take a few minutes out of each lesson to do some exercise from this. And you'll see some students as stiff as a board and then you give them one of the sensory relaxation exercises. Somebody else is just like, okay, too relaxed. And then you'll give them the, some structural robot exercise or something. So I'd like this to be experiential so that you can actually feel a little bit what the results are in your own hand. And then you'd be, I better be able to, to, to figure out which of all these exercises might be useful for that kid or that kid. Yeah, we have a we have an online study group where we we, we go people who are familiar with pianos we, we play some piece of music and then, and then they say okay which of these twenty eight chapters would be useful for learning this Bach prelude and fugue or this Chopin Nocturne. Some, some and it's different things for different compositions even. So there are eight sections. The introduction to lying down. That's the pre-standing apprenticeship. Now the next should be standing up. But I decided to put the thumb before standing up because the, that thumb is just so weird. And we're gonna we're gonna really experience that in a palpable way in a few minutes. Then standing up, then Section four for walking and running. Uh, section five, rotation, that thing that I was talking about before. Hopping and leaping, section six. And, then, and a lot of people, like a lot, many times I ask a, a group of piano, piano teacher to do this, so we should all do it. Let's do this. Uh, pretty good. Oh, you, you guys are great. Because I, I remember Minneapolis, Minnesota piano teacher with 100 people. Literally half of them were doing it because we're, we're, we're taught to curl our fingers. And I said, no, 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 do this. We are, we are doing this. <laughs> yeah. Okay, wait a minute. Look at your neighbor. Look at your hand. Oh my God. <laughs> so so th th I spent a lot of time building up this hip joint of the hand. Yeah? the metacarpal phalangeal joint. Because in many times, that's the deficient joint. We curl the fingers very well. You'll see. Try it, try it on the desk or on your knee. If you just curl the finger like that, the, the hand's hip joint actually goes down. So of course, and you see people playing like that. I've heard of teachers actually telling their students to, oh no, that's too high. Make this go down like that. And I said, well, well professor, it hurts. <laughs> Don't worry, you'll get used to it. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Hello, yeah? yeah? Can you talk a little bit about thumb? Like she's interested in your thumb? Yeah. The thumb? Yeah, because they all know this. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's just like the thumb is located. I have to have a PMC arthroplast. Oh I try to overcome this. Yeah, yeah so she will be in Louis. Yeah. Is, is, is it just uh, uh, hypermobile or is it actually dislocated? But is it dislocated or hypermobile? Uh -huh, uh -huh. And you're gonna love this. Yeah, I'm because, really excited. Because in, in what we're gonna do, again, I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit, is we're gonna use the hypermobility to our advantage. So again, this is an ideal moment to discuss, again, this building the muscles. So when it, when I do this, like the, the swamp monster, for instance, if you do the swan monster a little bit farther, then it comes right up into this standing structure, which is almost like a, a bird beak. You see, it's almost like a triangle. Now, it looks muscular, but then you can stand your hand in 
that in that shape like a house of cards. Like it, and so take all the way up, almost, almost float off the desk, almost float off the desk, and then just tiny, like a two grab, a half an ounce of pressure through the fingertip, a half an ounce of pressure through the fingertip, just in a way where, oh, you feel bony connections, but no muscular stress. So if I have somebody who's totally healthy, I might tell them to stand the thumb up, like this, exercise, exercise. For somebody who's hypermobile, I might take the thumb and let's let's go in and, and, and don't break your computer screen if you do it on the computer. But you can try it. You won't break your computer screen. You can do it, do it because you go in like this, and then as if you were gonna take take an eye out like a ninja warrior, but don't. Just a half an ounce of pressure, a half an ounce of pressure. And when you back off and don't use any muscular stress, no muscular stress, even here, no muscular stress, no, almost float off and just a tiny little bit of that, boom, there you go. A, a slight, the slightest of slight compression. The nervous system gets a chance to feel how to align the bones even as if in the absence of muscular effort altogether. So there's no weight going through. Like a hot air balloon, you're gonna take the weight off and you're just gonna leave the impression of a bony connection. There's a tiny, precise little bit of pressure through. It's not weight, it's a skeletal connection. It's those bones on the neck. And, you, and then once you've felt that, it already feels really weird and then you kind of wobble around on it a little bit. And, the, and then you see, with, if there's no pressure, if it's just maintaining connection, then you can, oh, you, the muscles have to adjust, the muscles have to adjust, but, but they can because they're sensing so much more because there's so much less stress. And you actually educate the nervous system to the, the sense of a well-aligned thumb bone and how that thumb bone connects So if you do that, then, then this, if you did this many, many times, then slowly the motor cortex, this is the particular part of the brain that doesn't, <laughs> uh, 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 that doesn't deal with thinking, talking. But it's just, you know, I'm going to raise my hand there. 250 muscles took part. The motor cortex is going, is going you know, uh, flex the deltoid, decontract the, the triceps, the, modify the bicep. There's hundreds of neurological commands for any action that we do. So that's the motor cortex. It's a genius. Like It does way more than the thinking mind can do. So what we're doing here, we're giving the, oh, just skeletal function, just skeletal and many, many different configurations, and we're giving the motor cortex information on which it can reprogram. And at the end, the fact that there's hypermobility comes as an advantage. Because when you get the sense of skeletal connection, oh, you're hypermobile. You, you already have your muscles interfering less than most of us. So if you use this form of kinesthetic neurological learning, you can actually get ahead of the game. But it's really complex, and it, it doesn't happen all at once, but it's a, a path of inquiry which could really prove useful for you, okay? And you, all of you, listen up, and for yourself, even if your thumbs are fine, even for a, a thumb which doesn't have any hypermobility issues, this refinement of the action of the thumb leads to a new sense of potent, capable movement on the feet. Okay? And it, it comes again, not from doing a piano playing exercise, but figuring out sensorially how the thumb works. Now, I did give uh, a lot of importance to the thumb, so much so that. Um, Where's that strange? Well, I we we my 
artist here. He's done a lot of really amazing drawings, but one of the most peculiar, of course, I can never remember where it is. <laughs> I don't know my own work. Um, yeah, I really do. Where was that? So it's an archaeological dig where they found a skeleton, but uh, one half of the pelvis of this skeleton is missing. Anyway, so the there's half a pelvis missing. So the, on the finger side, the fingers go, you know, that ankle, knee, hip joint, metacarpal bone is the pelvis, and then L5S1 is this hip joint. And the thumb goes ankle, knee. The hip joint is right where the spine is. So it's so weird. And so, you know, if if if, if my two legs were like my thumb and my finger, I would be walking like this. But somehow the pianist does something that even though my, my legs are like different, attached differently to myself, somehow it even so, so it's doing more. This hand and wrist is doing way more to compensate for this different thumb than the pelvis does in normal walking. <coughs> okay, quickly now. Uh, section one is Lying down, the pre-standing effect. Uh, so would you please only do this as one hand because I want us to feel the immediate effects of these exercises on the hand. I've had uh, occupational therapists come to me and say, well, you should teach this to occupational therapists. It's too good for the hand to handle. Uh, so uh, let's keep track. Here we are. Uh, yes. So I didn't really put these in the best order. I think I think the best order would have been chapter five, first of all. Uh, which is so let's do chapter five first. So you this is Sleepy Bear. This is this is my favorite of all my all the dragon. It's this wonderful drawing. I would sh I would take a little video of my hand doing a particular exercise and then he would draw an animal. Just out of his imagination, related to that exercise. <laughs> He's a, I love the drawings. I'm very happy about that. But so there's one hand on your on your desk or on your thigh or whatever. Just but it's the way you do this that makes it effective. So you're going to roll it, but as if the hand has no muscles at all. So you actually the, the forearm just rolls like that, and it's so the hand is entirely passive, and you're watching your hold your hand with curiosity to, to see, well, which fingers fold in on which other fingers and which fingers unfold and how does all that work? And now we're going to roll back and, and, oh, my thumb muscles are not moving. My arm is moving and it's kind of, oh, the thumb kind of folds in. But because there's no effort anywhere and the fingers are folding, the table is folding my fingers. And because there's no effort, the brain, the sensory motor system, feels the, the bones, the relationship of one bone to another. And you see, even, I've done this for years already, you see my fingers twitching. It's like, what? It's like, well, that's why you just roll over here. And you can see it, it kind of folds like a, like a deflated balloon, as if your hand was a deflated balloon, and then you just rolled it this way, and rolled it that way. And you can do it without the help and you see, it looks really weird. Uh, yeah. It kind of looks like an octopus or something. It looks like a jellyfish or something. Yeah. So this should have probably been the chapter, the first chapter, in the lying down section. Maybe the second edition will have that change. Okay. Yeah, that's really number one. Now, number two, lay the hand like this and make all the fingers together as if it was a seal clipper. And the important one for all of these is that you leave the heel of the hand heavy on the table or on the keyboard, if you don't have a keyboard, and you leave the arm free. So if you have, and then the, you're going to just plop the seal clipper over here, and then plop the seal clipper over there. Now, if you do it without the arm moving, that will immediately make tension. 
So you flop the seal to go over here, the, the arm response. You flop the seal to go over there, the arm response. And then you get this sense of freedom. And so my secret here is that I, I, I just embedded the heel of the hand in the keys for this whole first section to stop people playing to give the infant, the, uh, the child, a sense. I don't play with my arm weight. My arm has weight, and it's going to be it's going to be a big part of the game. But I'm not going to move the key with the weight of my arm. I'm going to move the key with the arm skeleton. You can see it's a seal flipper, but it's also connected to the arm. Through this pivot point of the heel, which is lying somebody in a secure, the, the big thing here, this heel feels good. Uh, you, this is going to work for you better if you actually make a seal flip. You know, you glue them together, glue your fingers together. Yeah, like that. And now feel how different that is. Look, it feels completely different. Let your arm move more. Yeah, that's the goal. Yeah, so these exercises are really potent if you do them in a functional way. That's right. I'm glad I caught you. Huh? He did a good job. He did a good job. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Yours is great. Yeah, yeah. Yours is great. Cool. Next, uh, make your hand into a birdie. So you clamp the thumb to the second, and you actually make a triangle here. And many times we're going to use this birdie with the thumb lying down horizontally. So get to feel that thumb. Totally secure. It's like the, an A-frame cottage, you know those A-frame houses? And the thumb is like the floor of the A-frame. And the finger and the hand are the two roofs, the roof, side roof of the A-frame. And then, then again, leave your heel sunk into the white keys and boom, on the flat key, boom, on the flat key. That's it, and use your arm. Use your arm more again. That's it. See, you're, you're very, the trouble is, you're really differentiated. It's like a ballet dancer. Like for you, it's no problem to do this, and not, yeah. So fine, very good, good on you. But it's it's not as functional as this one. When you, you when the arm responds to the hand, then they are more talking to each other, working with each other. And here, and especially you'll have some students if they do it this way, problems will develop later on because this produces more attention. Now, you're really beautifully differentiated, so it won't produce more attention in you, but in some others it won't. And for, you'll get something new when you do it like this. Then again, we're going very quickly here. Uh, the heel of the hand and flop back like this, and flop back like this. And again, there's, it's so easy to do this one in a tense way. Watch, I'm going to do it tense. If you watch me closely, you can almost see the t my whole body like. Something in my body went with this in slow motion like that. So you feel it, you just zoom like that, but it's, it feels free because it ripples through the whole body. I have to put a little piece of paper in here mentioning that because I did not stress it strongly enough in these first chapters. The Italian edition actually has two extra sentences in each of these chapters saying, Really, really make sure, like what I told you, you involve the body. So that was, uh, yeah. So Sassy Seal is the second chapter. The, the bird beat was the, was the third, third chapter. The, the, the chicken peck is like, the chicken pluck is like the fourth chapter. And then Sleepy Bear is the fifth chapter. So that, now, did you all do this with only one hand? OK. Let your two hands hang by your side. And see, does one hand feel different? What's the sensory change, the sensory, the perception of your own hand that happens? <coughs> Maybe nothing, I don't know. <laughs> don't just tell me you feel the difference because you want to get you know, points with the teacher. I feel uh, a tingling like the blood in me. A tingling? Yeah. Like the blood? Let go. That's great. That's great. That's, uh, yes. Can I get yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll pay you after. <laughs> Anybody else? Feel free to say, oh, really. 
when I did, started Feldenkrais, the, the, the professor always said, now feel the differences between left and right. What is she talking about? <laughs> I don't feel anything, let alone differences. It's a sense of the midline, like, like, and I realized, if I'm lying on the floor, at that point in time, I had no idea which part of me is on the right. And it was just like, it's chaos. It was very interesting. It was kind of, yeah, and disturbing. But anyway, it was it, later on, you know, you, you do these sensory exercises and slowly the capacity develops. So anybody else feel anything or you're all? Another thing, if you're all really well differentiated, then maybe somewhere in your brain, your, your brain already knows how to do that. So okay, I did it again. But if your brain already knows how to do that in some way, shape, or form, then you won't feel the differences. I don't really know that. So mostly you feel the differences when it's new and something opens up. So now we get to the thumb, this uh, fascinating digit. I, I, I had to make a, a picture of the hand where there's the four fingers here and the thumb over there somewhere, hiding under a lily pad. And of course the swan is the thumb and the ducks are the, the fingers. Yeah. And then we, we he had the orangutan. Now this guy is playing the piano like this. And you see he's playing a banana keyboard. <laughs> this is kind of fun. But this comes out of, I had a student, he's still my student, he organized this master classes for me in Munich, a Spanish guy, Mario de la Vega. And he decided, I'm not going to teach technique to my kids at all. I'm just going to watch their hands do what they do. And what do they, what's a little child's hand going to do spontaneously? And they all, without exception, they would play like this, and like this, and like this, and like this, and <laughs> da, 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 and <laughs> like that. And he said that went on for about two months, and then spontaneously they started doing something more like this. So it, it, the kid spontaneously came from this instinctive need to feel a stable, potent, structural thumb. So the first thumb exercise, the oranga thumb, is to simply stand the thumb up on the pad like that. You do it with only one hand here. And then turn it as if you were turning a screwdriver. And look at how many people are kind of wobbling, or this joint is bending, or the back joint is bending. Or so back off if there's too much pressure. Or for some people, it's put more pressure to feel, but make it really a screwdriver now. You know the shaft of a screwdriver doesn't wobble around the shaft of a screwdriver, just turns. So very gently, you feel very gently or with some pressure. Different people have different learning styles, but you're trying to notice which of these two joints wobbles. And can I change the angle of my arm? Can I move the hand over here or over here? I, uh, that's what those, those wobbly toys, what's it called? Those dolls that have a lead weight in them on. Weevil. A weevil. Yeah, a weevil. Yeah, so make your thumb like a weevil until it finds the point where it could turn like this with both its joints maintaining their alignment. Okay? And then finally, uh, do this close to the edge, like, like as if you were on a white teeth. So that you can come down here and make a thumb print. That's right. And now go back up, go back up, and again, screwdriver, 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 whole body screwdriver. Look what I'm doing. See how different that makes it? Look at this whole body screwdriver. Way better for your kids. The title of my fourth book, Play the Piano with Your Whole Self. This is a case in point. And then when you come down here and do the thumb print, now the thumb may bend a little bit, and you can even bend that nail joint a little bit, gently, 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 gently. And then when you come back up, do you feel coordinated or wonky? Or can you come back up and straighten it again, but in a controlled way, in a balanced way, okay? And then the next time, thumb print down here. And then up we go, and next time we do the screwdriver, we're gonna extend can the thumb stay balanced on its all its joints, even when the fingers are up like that? So we come down and up, and one more time with fingers. Yeah, pretty good. I think I did good. And take a rest, and again, notice how deep.
different uh, the hand that hand feels from the other hand. <laughs> but you've done this before, right? You're you're Jana, right? No, wait a minute. Who's who's the, the pianist who, who who plays at at uh, the United Church? Your student is she not here today? The okay. You you okay? <laughs> I, why did I? Yeah, she saw you yesterday. Okay. Josh oh, yeah. Okay, I'm getting yeah. confused. Sorry. Yeah. I'm the one who called you first. Yeah. So yeah. you, but you, you've done this before because we did it last yeah. summer, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> she's got a head start. Yeah. But anyway, and you know, some of these may seem simple to you, but, but many people, even advanced pianists, think, oh my God, like, why is this? It, it feels so empowered. It's like, I, and it's difficult. It's like all sorts of muscles are working that don't usually work. Well, look, the thumb has this inner groove. Now, do you know about the inner groove? This big bulge here, that's the largest groove in the body. So when the thumb tries to be like a finger, this inner groove is basically out of the game. So you're trying to play the thumb mostly with the bottom two phalanges of the thumb. So it's this opposition and this standing, which is a reverse opposition, by the way, which engages this inner now, uh, I kept it to 28 lessons, so I didn't do the, the fifth finger. But the fifth, which finger is stronger? So the four string fingers of the four fingers, which is stronger? The second. Huh? The second. The second. The second. Everybody sing the second. The third. No, uh, the piano second, not the violin second. The middle finger. Nobody says the fifth. Of course the fifth is not the strongest. It's the smallest. The fifth finger is the strongest finger. Look, the fifth finger has this hypothenar. It's the second largest muscle. And if you, let's do an exercise, which is not a piano. You just draw, straighten the finger, curl the other finger, draw the hand back like this, like that. Can you see that? Keep the finger straight. That's it, keep it straight and draw it back. That and draw it there. And you see, look, this muscle is working like a son of a thing. You feel that? That's the strongest muscle for any finger. And that's why we have bass lines and soprano lines. Because the fifth finger is most responsible for the most important parts of, in a piano uh, piece, yeah? So together, now I'm gonna be rude, together these two, remember the hand is a mini body? So what would that make these two muscles? The butt cheeks of your hand. I'm sorry, this is a university presentation. I don't know if I should be talking that way. <laughs> this is my DVD version of the Crafted Piano Playing, by the way. The first cover had a picture of the hand from here, like that, because I wanted to show that art structure. And in the DVD, we superimposed this picture of the hand with a, a cathedral arch structure. And the fingers line up beautifully with the, the ribs of the arch of the cathedral. Very cool. And my father, bless his heart, took a look at that and says, why do you have a baby's butt on your piano <laughs> seat? <laughs> so so then, then we changed the cover. <laughs> we did not leave that on. <laughs> so you see the fifth finger, very, very important. Next one for the thumb is now to clamp the thumb into a bird beak again. And simply use one hand slide like this. And the, 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 the composition which I did, which is, again, uh, very, very simply sliding back and forth, but with the actual bird beak structure, per firmly clamped. So like that, like that. Right? So it's, again, nobody's going to play the piano like that. But when you play the piano like that, all these muscles are engaged. And these hand muscles are so important for moving the fingers for freedom and potency. So now they're engaged to hold, but that's a stepping stone to being engaged to move, okay? So next, we lie the thumb back down and we flatten out that bird beak until the second finger is lying on top 
part of the sun, and we try to actually make it visible. So we'll make sure the second, the second can be. So the second metacarpal bone kind of lies on the sun's proximal phalange, and the second finger is proximal phalange lies on the sun's distal phalange. And you almost, you do it so you can't even see your own sun. And then you roll a little bit this way, and a little bit that way. And you feel the weight of your hand is clamping the sun. The weight of the hand is clamping the sun, and you'll feel Maybe some muscles in here will let go so that all three thumb bones, even the thumb metacarpal, are clamped into the thing. And there's this tremendous let go. And then at the key, we're going to play with the, 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 the fingers totally clamped like that. And then you see, I'm actually moving my arm so that my fingers can play the notes, even though they stay clamped like that. And then we even go in this, this alligator. Oh, I'm yeah, I'm, I jumped ahead of myself. I skipped over it. Okay. So we, anyway, the alligator, the, and this is crocodile jaws. This is not alligators because crocodiles have a long, thin snout. The alligators have a fatter snout. So the next one is going to be alligator. Uh, we skipped over one, which is to to instead of clamping the thumb like this, you clamp the thumb more like this, and then on the second finger, slide back and forth. So this sliding is very, very convenient because some people, they're too relaxed and the structure is gonna crumple, and some people are too tight, the structure can't move. So if you have to slide your finger on a key or on the table even, if the finger, if the hand is too loose and there's not enough muscle tone, if you're going to try to slide and you buckle. And if you're too tight, you're going to try to slide and <laughs> it's not going to move. So this sliding is a very convenient way of immediately establishing optimum muscle tonus in the hand. So we have to realize that muscle tonus and muscle tension are not the same thing. So the muscles contract. If a muscle contracts and there's movement, it's just a contraction and then it's gone. There's no tension, there's no tonus. Just, just a, contra a moving contraction is over. Now, muscular tension is a holding contraction that blocks movement, but muscular tonus is a holding contraction that helps movement. And that's what we don't realize. There's this middle ground. It's not just either tension or relaxation. If I'm so tense that I can't move, then that's te tension. It's muscular contraction. It's holding me and it's stopping me from moving. But look, if I didn't have a lot of holding contraction in my hip joint, I would just fall over. But you see, the hip joint can move even though there's a lot of the holding muscles and the moving muscles, they're coordinating with each other. And again, neurologically, that's really sophisticated. It takes a lot of brain real estate to manage the fine tuning of a muscle. This is a, one of my problems just to sort of wait the technique where you just let everything go. Because yeah, you let everything go, but then all the sounds are kind of fast and healthy and the same. And there's not uh, so much potential for discrimination. You let it go and then you build it up again. But here we're coming to a standing state where we're balanced and then we can have many precise levels of energy going to the key for all sorts of colors. And you see, we're building it up developmentally. We still haven't even got close to playing the piano. But we're investigating especially this weird thumb and how it relates and we're giving the hand a sensorial experience of the thumb's optimal relationship to the oh my god we're almost out of time very quickly the alligator yawns so now and then he comes down very gently because they're a birdie flew into his nose and he doesn't want so with sort of like with a lot of standing energy but very slowly as if against resistance as if the fingers are moving against him and then you feel this wonderful arch structure of the hand, and this space stays open. 
It's now relating to the thumb, that's right. And then of course the last time too, it could be because the alligator got hungry and then it just ate the bird. And actually, very, very good. Actually, my, my, uh, I got complaints about the, the alligator eating the birdie. So we had to, we had to put, we had to put the head back on with the goose, oh. and we say, it's a vegetarian alligator, don't worry, you oh. didn't eat the birdie. <laughs> so, 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 um, so, very, very, yeah, we, we're out of time, right? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. So, so that they can see all this impression, like in scale, you know, something, so, and you apply everything that you say, yes. you can show them really quickly so that yeah. they can see what all of Perfect. this will lead to. Yeah. So normally, when you see somebody play a scale, they'll put their thumb under like this. And you see, the, the thumb actually pulling itself under collapses the hand. Why? Because I flex the thumb. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna oppose the thumb. I'm gonna do the same thing. So here I am. And now, I oppose my thumb. Oh my God, it stood the hand up. It didn't pull it down, it actually stood it up. Not only did it stand it up, it moved it over. And I didn't even put my thumb under, but it's already under. I'm just, I'm not gonna put my thumb under, I'm gonna oppose it. Oh look, it went up. So, and now going the other way, you, you've seen it with all your students. They go like this and, and they put their hand over. They're flipping the hand over. So for me, the flipping the hand over, it, it indicates a, an inert thumb and an inert arm. So look, is the thumb again, by the way, the finger stands up by moving the hip joint. The thumb stands up by pushing the finger's hip joints up. That opens this space. And that makes again, turns the hand into a grasping hand, into an opposable thumb hand. Now, so if my if my thumb does not do that, then I have to flip over. My, my fingers go, where's the key? Where's the key? My thumb stands up. The arm responds, look, the arm feels that thumb stand and it goes along with it. And then now my finger goes, there's the key. Stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. Oh, there's the key. So very funnily, if you do this falling on the thumb, then that accent will, will last forever. But if I, I teach the people to stand up and actually Confirm that standing action of the thumb with an accent. This kind of ac accent. So did you see, if I tried to make the thumb accent in a healthy way by standing, the faster I go, the, the less the accent gets until at speed, it's going to But there's no hole, there's no fall down, there's no gap in the line. Because my thumb learns to activate in the, in, in, the appropriate way to, 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 again, collaborate with the whole hand so all the parts join together. That's a perfect example. The scales are at the very center of what we do. And so I've had to jump over a lot, but uh, we can stick around for a few minutes and you can look at some of these books and take a look at this if you have time. And of course, all of, uh, all of this information is on my website. There's a whole, there's a YouTube tutorials of uh, all 28 piano, piano moves. Oh no, I didn't bring enough. You can, you can share, you can share. Okay, sorry, I thought I brought enough. And, uh, and there's YouTube tutorials on all the pianos lessons, each of them about two minutes long, so you can follow through. And there's a, there's a Pianos Online Institute coming up if anybody's interested in registering for that. And this summer, I'm giving a, a workshop, two week institute here where uh, we go into pianos and the other books in great detail with covering a large uh, body of repertoire. That's July 7th to 13th and July 14th to 20th. You're probably all out of town, but, but uh, uh, that's another opportunity to explore piano somatics further. Uh, yeah, and you, you, my card is here if anybody needs contact with us. So, I'm very, been very attentive. I hope you notice the changes in your hand even from only doing the first 10 chapters of these 28. And hopefully you'll start thinking about how this could apply to the 
piano pedagogy style that I envisioned using in my studio when I started teaching when I graduated and left. And if you have any questions, do we, do we have a few minutes for questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, so uh, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. And if, if, if not, then if you have them later, you can email me, I'm always, always happy to chat. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, you guys have any pleasure. questions? Good questions? questions? Are you based in the States now? Uh, I live in Serbia. I, I'm, I'm Canadian from Montreal, but I live in Serbia, and I, well, I basically come here in the summer to do the Summer Institute, and uh, maybe once or twice a year apart from that. And I teach online as well. Uh, and we are, the Zoom lessons are not as good as a, a live lesson, but surprisingly good. In, in many, many of the things, I'm embarrassed to say that if, if, if the sound is good, but the, the picture is bad, I don't always know what to tell them. But when the picture is good, even if the sound is really bad, I always know what to tell them. Because I can see, oh, that hand is, or, or the hand is stiff, or the arm is going this way, and I should go that way. You can always see, and you can almost, with no sound, you can almost imagine the sound you're hearing, given. But that's because I'm weird. <laughs> and I've, I've been following this weird kind of path of exploration for a long time, so it's a little unusual. But useful. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Any other much. questions? Any yeah. questions? Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. So I have one more question. So uh, some. Some students have some the core on the left hand, and the and the, and the melody note need to like the, you you need to bring out all the melody. But sometimes I feel 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 stressed my hand and the sound is not really helpful. So do you have any like good tips for that? Yeah. So the beautiful the standing action brings the hand up into its arch structure. But did you notice the arm follows? And now, if I wanted to walk onto another key, the thing we don't realize is that the arm should not be helping the, the finger go down because it stops it from doing its real job. As my torso moves smoothly when I walk, the arm, the arm moves through the phrase. Many, let's take a broken chord. Many people, they play a broken chord like that. Why? Because the nervous system says, it's just a chord and it's broken, so my arm is here. And it sounds stiff and mechanical. There's no melody, there's no legato, actually. There's no, it's not a singing legato sound. So if I just, I stand up here and, oh, by the way, if my arm is 180 degrees, if my finger is 180 degrees to the key, that's the best movement. It's the best. Now 180 degrees. Now 180 degrees. Now 180 degrees. If each finger is at, a, at the, of the best angle, then it moves the key with the greatest freedom. So, so look at my arm now. Yeah! And especially we need to go to the thumb. So the thumb, because it, Chopin said the second finger is the middle of the hand, and look, distance from second to the thumb is the same as the distance from the second to the fifth. So if my fifth, first, second, and now, to get to my thumb note, I should move my arm all the way over there. It's an arm thumb. Remember we said the thumb's connected directly to the arm. The fingers are connected to the hands or the wrists of the arm. So move your arm to the inside more than you're used to, and you get you instantly get this lateral arm movement. So, and then it's a question of degree. Some people I have to teach them to stand up more, and then they start playing the gato. Other people, I, I virtually don't talk about the stand-up, even if it's deficient. I'll just say, look, move your arm this way, move your arm that way. And that brings a beautiful legato, and the hand starts standing up much more naturally because it feels it can. Why does it feel it can? Because the arm is in its way. When I get out of the chair, do the legs contract first, or does the body move first? Have you ever thought about this? So, you just try to get out of a chair without moving your body. Mm -hmm. Look, and we move the body very far before the legs even begin to unfold. So if I start to play a melody and my arm is already in motion, my arm is already in motion, 
that's gonna free the fingers to stand up with ease and lightness and agility. So does that answer your question? One quick question. Yeah. Jenny, octave, yeah. I'm really thinking about your thumb in an octave. Yeah. Oh. Sure, yeah. Yeah, so lower 10. So it's like, if I'm doing an octave, yeah. octave and then do 11, mm -hmm. and then octave. But it's a very fast beat, so mm -hmm. it's kind of like Yeah, I don't know. So yeah. here, try to try to play the octave uh, with a straighter thumb. So that's actually easier to do. Do you see your thumb is bent? That's yeah. Now straighten your thumb more. No, straighten the bottom straight, joint of your thumb. Like oh. yeah, and now do it on a black key so you can lie down. Now look, does your hand feel different right now? Yeah. Yeah. It feels better. So. But we all bend the thumb because we think, oh, if I don't bend my thumb, I'm going to play like that. I have to bend it in order to play clean. But look, there's a way of playing clean without bending the thumb. Get out to the tips of the white key and you play the thumb just for you. You see, if, I, if my thumb stays straight, and now look, fingers move easily. Now look, my thumb is going to be curled. My thumbs move, my fingers move with great difficulty. Look, look at my second metacarpal phalangeal joint. I straighten the thumb. Look what it does. Here goes up. I bend my thumb. It pulls it down. Now you can, many times we have to play with a bent thumb, but we need to find out how to bend that thumb without pulling that metacarpal phalangeal joint down. Because basically the action you want is the thumb empowering the hand. And the more the thumb straightens, the easier it is to empower the hand. I'll even add to that octave a supination. Yeah, Sup supination is turning the hand this way. Yeah, that's that. That's going to solve your problem. That's it. That's going to solve your problem. Yeah, very good question. Very interesting. You see, even a, a somewhat complex uh, technical problem can be addressed when we think of the hand as a, a structural series of levers, a skeleton of a series of levers. How do they work best together? Okay? Thank Great. you. Yes. Thank you. And enjoy the eclipse. It's yes. already started. Yeah. It's already started. Yeah. Get your, don't forget your glasses. Thank <laughs> you.